Now, friends, we've come to a very interesting chapter here, chapter 2 of this very wonderful little epistle of Colossians. And in the first section, the first 15 verses, you have Christ is the answer to philosophy. And then we have, as we move on down in the chapter, we come to Christ is the answer to ritual from verses 16 through 23. Now, the answer to philosophy is for the head. The answer of ritual is to the heart. So that, as we've made the statement at the beginning, that Christianity has always been in the danger of sailing between Scylla and Charybdis. That's the two points that Aeneas had to put his boat through in Virgil's Aeneas, you will recall. And it was very difficult. On one side, there was a danger. The other side, there was a grave danger. And Christianity, on one extreme, is always in danger of evaporating into a philosophy. There is a danger of it becoming nothing in the world but just steam. Then, on the other hand, there is a danger of it freezing into a form, that is, a ritual. And that is a grave danger. You see, the Lord Jesus didn't say, I'm the steam of life. He didn't say that I'm the ice of life. He said, I'm the water of life. And therefore, we need to guard against following the line of philosophy or following the line of ritual today. Christianity is Christ. Now, there were in the Colossian church five errors that endangered the Colossian church that he's going to deal with in this chapter. The first one is enticing words, verses 4 through 7. Then there was the danger of philosophy, verses 8 through 13. Then there was the danger of legality, verses 14 through 17. Then the danger of mysticism, verses 18 and 19. And then asceticism, verses 20 to 23. And these are the dangers I would say today. I think that most of us could sit down and take this chapter, go through it, and make an inventory of our spiritual life to see which direction we're going, see whether we may have slipped into one of these systems, and a great many, even so-called Bible believers, have slipped into one or two of these systems here. Now I'm going to begin to read here chapter 2, verse 1 of Colossians. He says, "...for I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. Now, Laodicea was right near Colossae. I had been to Laodicea, but not to Colossae. But I could stand on the high point and look across that Lycus Valley and see along by the side of the mountain there by the gates of Phrygia that leads into the Orient and into the east. And that was the ruins of Colossae. And it was a great city, but it was not really nearly as great as Laodicea. And that's one of the seven cities, you remember, that John wrote to. That was the lukewarm place. So that the danger here and that which caused great conflict in the heart of the apostle Paul, and by the way, that word conflict is our word agony, And MacPhail calls it prayer agony. We need a lot of agonizing in prayer, I think. And this is prayer agony. And Paul saw that there was a grave danger. This is about a 100 miles inland from ancient Ephesus, Ismir today, or ancient Smyrna. And it's an area, apparently, that when Paul came through that area, and he did twice, he did not come that particular direction because even when he attempted on his second missionary journey to go down into Asia, the Spirit of God forbade him. So he turned and took the northern route. And so when he came the third time overland walking, he apparently, not knowing the southern route, he did know the northern route, he took that. So apparently he never was in Colossae. 
and he never was in Laodicea. And he mentions that as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. Now, he has great agony for them because they were in danger of going in one or two directions here. And that's the danger of the church today. And that explains, as it did later on in Laodicea, their lukewarm condition that they had lost sight of the person of Christ because Christ is the answer to the head of man. He's the answer to the heart of man. Now, will you notice as we move along into this section, when he says, as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, I think it makes it very obvious that Paul had not been to Colossae or that they had so many new believers there that had come in since he was there that they hadn't seen his face. But I think that's highly unlikely. Now, he mentions here in verse 2, that their hearts might be comforted. Now, heart here indicates the entire inner man. That means the whole propulsive nature of man. That's our humanity. That their hearts, their humanity, their persons might be comforted. And the word here actually means knit together and might be comforted, being knit together in love. And that means compacted. Love just draw them together. And after all, the thing that unites a church is not gifts or even what we call today spirituality. The thing that unites believers is love, friends. It's the cement that holds us together. It's Elmer's glue, if you please. Now he says here, being knit together in love and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding. Full assurance is a very interesting word. It means under full sail. It means that believers should be moving along, moving along spiritually, moving along for God. And he speaks of that here. The full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. And I grant that that's a rather awkward expression here. And I very frankly feel like probably the better way of translating this here at this particular place would be the mystery of God, even of the Father and of Christ. Or the easier way is the mystery of God, even Christ. And I think that probably is correct. Now, what is the mystery of God, even Christ? Well, today, the mystery is the church, for it was not revealed in the Old Testament. God was going to save Gentiles. He made that clear in the Old Testament, and he did save them. But at the beginning of the day of Pentecost, God began a new thing, calling out a group of people into the body of believers, baptized into the body of believers. And that is what he means over in 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, verses 12 and 13. For as the body is one, hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many, are one body, so also is Christ. You see, Christ had a physical body when he was here on this earth. He has a spiritual body down here today, and that's the body of believers that have trusted him. And it's called Christ. He could say to Saul of Tarsus, why are you persecuting me? I'm persecuting him personally. Why? The church is Christ. It belongs to him. We've been baptized into him. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. So you see, this is what brings the unity in the church. And we're told today not to make a unity. You can't join an organization and expect that organization to bring about church unity. The Holy Spirit's already done that. He puts all believers in one body, and we're told to keep the unity of the Spirit. problem today is that we're not keeping the unity of the Spirit. Now he says, "...in whom..." and that's Christ, are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now, he's going to deal with this matter of philosophy, as we have indicated. Enticing words and philosophy, the thing that 
is enticing so many young preachers today. In most of our seminaries, philosophy and psychology has been substituted for the Bible. And I'm amazed how little some of these boys, even with Ph.D. degrees, who come out of seminaries, how little they know about the Bible. Now, they know all about Bultmann. They know about Kant. They know about Plato. But they don't seem to know very much about the Word of God. And that is the great problem, actually, today. Now, there was a danger of that in Colossians. And I think that's what actually killed not only the church of the Colossians, but actually the one in Laodicea. That was the weakest church of the seven, you know, and in the worst spiritual condition. And yet they thought they were better off. It was a wealthy city. Laodicea was, and so was Colossae. Very wealthy place, a place of affluence. And they boasted of their wealth. They boasted of their knowledge there. And that's always a grave danger, you see. But now, if we should only learn, friends, that in whom, in Christ, are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now, you're going to get all you need in Christ. Oh, if we'd only learn that. And he is the one today. The church is the mystery. And Christ is the mystery. That is, the church. And we're told here that he is the reservoir of all knowledge. In the science building where I went to college, there was a motto on the bulletin board that was there the whole time I was in college. And it made a great impression on me. I'm afraid I'll know more about it than I did about any of the sciences I studied there. And it was this little motto, next to knowing is knowing where to find out. And I love that. Next to knowing is knowing where to find out. Well, friends, I don't know everything, and I'm sure many of you have discovered that by now, but I know where to find out because I know somebody who does. Christ has been made unto us wisdom, and we need to rest in that. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are in him, and how wonderful this is. Now he begins to move down into this area where he's going to deal with this subject here. First, it'll be enticing words here, beginning now with verse 4. He says, "...and this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words." Now, the word beguile here means to victimize you. That means oratory, our sweet talk. I heard of a theologian. He's great at using big words and also of trying to be very deep. And he is very deep. I heard this little story about him that he was speaking to a group. There's a man standing on the outside of the group, and another man walked up. And he'd been talking now 30 minutes. So this man that walked up said to the man standing there, says, what's he talking about? And the fellow says, well, he hadn't said yet. Well, to tell the truth, he never would say. And you never would know really what he's talking about. I heard of a dear lady that attends a certain church. And she says, oh, I just love to go there because the preacher uses such flowery language. And it just makes me feel so good all over. That's the danger today. A great many people love this pretense toward intellectuality among preachers and not giving the simple Word of God. The idea today to try to appear to be very intellectual. And I know something about that because when I started in the ministry, you see, I had been exposed to liberalism. I went to a liberal college. And when I say liberal, I mean liberal. And that's all I knew at that time. I was not grounded in the Word at all, although I'd had a wonderful pastor. But I wasn't grounded in the Word. And I wanted to be an intellectual preacher. I thought that would be great. But thank God that was knocked out of me shortly after I even was in college. To teach and give out the Word of God. Now he says, beware of this sort of thing. They'll beguile you with enticing words, and they'll victimize you. And the number of people that 
follow certain individuals. They don't follow the Word of God. They follow the individual. And it's like the Pied Piper of Hamlin. He starts playing, and they start following. Now he goes on to say here, "...for though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the Spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ." Now, at this time, the word that was coming to Paul was that this church was standing. And he says, I beheld your order. Now, that order is a military term, and it means to stand shoulder to shoulder. And that's what believers ought to be doing, standing shoulder to shoulder. But today, they not all doing that. they trying to undermine another believer, are trying to maybe take advantage in some way. Oh, if we could only get back to this. And then the word steadfastness, that means a solid front. It means to be immovable. And actually, the word here is stereotype. And that's opposed to movable type. And Paul speaks about being unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And that's what he's talking about. This church here at Colossae at this time had that reputation, and Paul wanted them to continue like that and not be led away by the oratory of some. Now we are told here, and he moves on, he says, "...as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him." Now that's a very wonderful statement to begin, if you'll notice, What does it mean to be a Christian? And I don't like the word commitment today at all. I am hearing a great deal. In fact, I have a letter from some man that tells me I'm not saved. He's praying I'll be saved because he said, I very frankly admit that I am not perfect, that I do not keep even all the Ten Commandments. And he says that I'm not saved until I do. Well, what does it really mean to be saved? It means to receive a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. Listen to Paul. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Now that you received him, now walk in him. And that, my friend, is a very wonderful thing. That's what it means to walk in the Spirit, you see today. Learn to walk. Through this life, and walking is not a balloon ascension. A great many people think the Christian life is some great overwhelming experience, and you take off like a rocket going out into space. Well, that's not where you live the Christian life. It's in your home, in the office, in the schoolroom, on the street. And the way you get around is walk. And you're to walk in Christ today. All that you and I might be joined to him like that. Then he goes on to say, rooted and built up in him. That's a very interesting expression. Rooted, that means like a tree. That's a living thing. And built up as a house. And that's not a living thing, but has a tremendous foundation. And that foundation, Paul tells us elsewhere, is Jesus Christ. Now, as you've received the Lord Jesus, walk in him. Doing what? Rooted. That means drawing your life from him as a tree and then and built on him, your faith that rests upon him, built up and in the faith is by your faith, I think would be the proper thing. It means by which you and I lay hold of Christ today. Now we come 8 through 13, the danger of philosophy. Verse 8, beware. Now, he says, that means look out. Stop looking, lest lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of man, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Now, if you follow down the story of philosophy, beginning with Plato and coming on down, and even following many of the church fathers, you will find that none of them, including Kant and and Locke, and even Bultmann right now, he seems to be the craze with some of these theologians. None of them have a high view of the inspiration of the Word of God. In other words, they're looking for an answer 
to the problems of life. Well, you don't find it in philosophy. Now, a true philosopher is a seeker after the truth. But you see, Christ is the answer. And that expression, Christ is the answer, I always wish they'd ask the question if they're going to say Christ is the answer. He's the answer to philosophy. He's 